feel like sometimes life is really mental. Dude, that's actually a really good name for a podcast. <laughs> Failing is a necessary part of succeeding. Failure is something that you have to just go through. If I'm also honest, like I, I'm driven by a fear of failure more than a need for success. Welcome back, beautiful people. We have had the most wild episode today. Before we get into it, make sure to share, like, subscribe, follow us at Really Mental Podcast. Today, we've got an amazing guest, Bruno Major, and we will be talking about the chaos of being an artist. I wanted to ask you, Will, to start us off, what is it like being an artist and do you ever feel like you're in the chaos? In terms of the chaos of an artist, I feel as though there are definitely moments when it's really tough to talk about what artists have to talk about on songs. For me, it's, you know, about my deepest emotions, mental health, my anxieties, my fears. And some of those aren't pretty to write. And it's part of the chaos is the fact that for me as an artist, I derive a lot of my identity from what I do because the process of making music is just I feel as though there's nothing like it in terms of translating an experience into a song. So you get that high that a lot of other things in life don't necessarily compare to. And on top of that, you're also balancing the fact that you want your songs to have a certain level of success materially or with metrics. So it's easy to lose yourself in that process and get away from what you started with, which was the actual creation of the art. I loved speaking with Bruno, and I think you're going to really enjoy this conversation that we're about to get into. We're really grateful to have him on the show. We're fans of his art, and we're really excited to get into this topic. So if you enjoy this, then make sure you share it with a friend who could find value from it as well. And without further ado, we're going to hop into it and welcome our good old mate Bruno from England. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do and what you love to do and why? So I am a musician, a songwriter, artist. I effectively write songs about my feelings and my experiences in life. And I record them and put them on the internet. And then I travel around the world and play them for people. And for some reason, my experiences and my diary of those experiences help other people to digest their own versions of those issues and experiences. When you first started with music, was it your intention to do that? It wasn't my intention, if I'm honest. I, I always knew I, I wanted to do music because I was not very good at much else except for music and, and writing. Um, and it's the thing that I enjoyed the most. But I, I always thought I was going to be a guitar player. My goal in life was to be, at one point, guitarist in the world, which is obviously an impossible task and one that I did not achieve. I have to be clear about that. But I, I kind of, in the process of learning guitar, I, I started writing songs and, and I, I very quickly realized that my, my art and my voice as an artist lay within the songwriting and not within the realms of instrumental, of guitar. But it's funny you should ask that question because I actually considered for a long time becoming a musical therapist. I, you know, I, I figured maybe I could help children um, with music or speech therapy or something like that. And bizarrely, now I make music, but I get a lot of people messaging me saying, my music is very therapeutic or it has a ASMR qualities or they put their babies to sleep at night with it or, you know, it helps them get through their workload or it helps them with their anxiety and with their depression and stuff. So I feel like in a roundabout way, perhaps, perhaps accidentally, I have kind of become a musical therapist of sorts. And how does it make you feel when people are saying those types of things about your songs and your artworks? It's a really beautiful feeling. I think I think there's there's a necessary degree of narcissism that must exist in order for you to be a, a solo entity in order for me to perpetuate Bruno Major as a commercial concept. There has to be a degree of narcissism because I'm effectively 
talking about myself the entire time. I'm plundering my my thoughts and my feelings and my emotions, and I'm I'm presenting them in a form of art for people to digest. So, I I, th- I think without that connection to people and without without hearing what that music does for other people and how it helps them in their lives, I think it would possibly be quite a lonely endeavor. And it, if I'm totally honest, it gives me meaning in my life when I hear that. Um, you know, I've had people message me saying, "Your music saved my life." The fact that them that there may be somebody who is alive right now that wouldn't necessarily be alive if I hadn't written a song, like that is crazy. And and it and it and it gives me a purpose and a and a and a feeling of um, a feeling that I'm doing the right thing. You know, mm. I'm following the right path. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. That is a wonderful thing. And I think those types of messages, I feel as though it must be sometimes hard to conceptualize because it is a name on the screen until it gets to showtime and you're playing in front of people. What is it like to play these songs that you've written in such a, a vulnerable and honest way? to so many people. If I'm totally honest, the, the, the biggest period of therapy and catharsis comes with the writing itself. Mm. I am not very good at talking about my feelings, bizarrely, and in, on a conversational level. And I struggle within relationships to voice my, my feelings in a, in a cohesive way. But I bottle them all up and siphon them into songs and sometimes I write songs and then I'll, I'll look at it afterwards and I'll think oh I feel like that and I had no idea before I'd written the song that that was how I felt when you then take them on tour and sing them every night it actually can be a bit numbing because it's in, I don't think it's healthy or or really even possible to put yourself back in the place that you were in when you wrote that song every night and also change up so quickly you know it's like there are disparate experiences within a set list and you might be talking about one relationship and then another relationship or a a loved one that passed away or or what or like it's whatever it is you can't like i can't personally like i'm not christian bale you know (laughs) what does like success look like for you at this point in your career well, I'm definitely more successful than I ever imagined I would be on a on a kind of empirical level. Um, I've always, I've always had a I've always had a very clear stance on on like success, which is I define success as having made a piece of art that I am proud of, because if that is how you define success, you can't fail. Because everything that I put out, I'm proud of. And so as far as I'm concerned with this third album, I'm so proud of it. I'm more proud of it than I am of any of anything I've ever done. And if I release it and no one listens to it, I'm still successful because I've done what I set out to achieve. I think if you define success as getting a song on the radio or getting this many streams or making this much money or whatever it is, those are empirical objectives that you can fail to achieve if you get them great go you but you might as well be selling hoovers but do you think failure is bad no failing is a necessary part of succeeding i like hyper focus on things and one of the things that i hyper focus on is golf and an amazing stat jack nicholas is the greatest golfer of all time he's got he's won more major championships and tournaments than anyone else even tiger woods and all of that but He's also the person who's got the most second place medals out of everyone. Because by necessity, he was in the position of winning the most during his whole career. So he failed more than anyone else. In order to succeed more than anyone else, he failed more than anyone else. I think that's a good lesson in life. Like failure is something that you have to just go through. But I'm, I'm, if I'm on, if I'm also honest, like I, I'm driven by a fear of failure more than a need for success. I hate the idea of, of, of not accomplishing something and not making my time here, you know, worthwhile. You know, I think life is so precious and I, I feel that I have been given 
a wonderful opportunity. I have a, you know, an ability and a, a gift and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm privileged in a very real way. I, I grew up in a, like, you know, a nice part of the world and I have a, a wonderful family who are so supportive of me and I feel like it would be really rude of me not to make the most of my time here. Yeah, I think that's important to acknowledge and have awareness about. What advice would you have for the people listening that are feeling as though they're just paralyzed and unable to make a decision about where they should go with their life or their career? I figured out quite a long time ago that thinking is the most stupid thing you can do most of the time. And it applies to so many situations. Like, like if, I sit, if I sit down at the piano to write a song and I start thinking and I'm like, Billy Joel wrote this or Beethoven wrote that or Carol King wrote this. Like, if you think about the weight of the, the people that have gone before you and the great things that they've achieved, sat at that same keyboard with the same pattern and the same access to the, the same history and the same inspirations. And then you start thinking about what chord comes next and you start thinking about what rhymes with this and what rhymes with that. You won't get anything done. But if you just sit at the piano and you just go, ah, and you let it calm out, like that's the only way that you, that you can make something great is by deactivating mm. your brain and mm. activating your feelings. Yeah. And I, and I feel like it's the same with life in general. Like if you overanalyze and you think about what's next and you, you can, you will be paralyzed. And, and I think sometimes you just, you've got to, you've got to just pick something and get on with it. I pick music. I think I, I would have, I could have picked anything and I kind of, I would have taken the same approach to life, which is just like, bury myself in it, get lost in it and, and like just, and do the best that I can at it. For you, where do you think being fearful of failure comes from? I have this theory that a uh, man's idea of success is based on the achievements of his father. Is it impossible to disassociate yourself from your father figure? My father figure is my father and he is a very successful man and he works incredibly hard. And he definitely instilled me and my brother with this kind of attitude to whatever we were doing that, that, that we had to treat it like a job and we had to work really hard. We, we, we always, we had, we always had to be the best. Like there's a, there's a video of me at the age of like 11 playing and Sebastian Bach piece on a classical guitar and I'm killing it. Like I'm this little kid on a guitar whose fingers can barely reach the frets and I'm like playing this very complex piece of classical music and you know, I finish it and my dad says, you made a mistake, play it again. And I, I'm, I'm like, but daddy, I played it perfectly. He's like, no, you didn't. You made a mistake, play it again. And then I play it again and I play it perfectly. That's the kind of upbringing that I had where it was like, that was good, now make it perfect. I've kind of applied that to my life in general and I'm not saying that this is a good thing at all because it has definitely led to all kinds of things like anxiety and self-esteem issues at times just general like terror like terror but I have a wonderful career and 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 I I I, I wouldn't change it for the world I love that you mentioned both the background with your father and in that context about wanting to be the best and also match it up with the fact that it also does, there are no perfect scenarios with life. What comes to mind for me when I hear that is when it comes to those moments of anxiety or doubt about going and achieving that great thing, that next thing, how do you push those to the side or, or deal with those in the context of your career and just life generally? Compartmentalizing helps a lot. I mean, look, I'll show you something. If you can see this. Yeah. This is the, the whiteboard that I made when I was making my album. 
You can see the Columbo at the top, and I've got all of the songs on the left where I'm uh, down here. And then on the right, I've got all these like markers. And so that was like different stages of the of the process. And I think like each day I would come in and I was like, right, I'm going to pick a song and I'm going to pick the piano part. And I'm just going to focus on this piano part today on day one. OK, let's make an album like it's a humongous task with many, many, many hundreds of hours of time needed to be spent and emotions plundered and like different sides of your brains reactivated at different times is like you just have to turn up every day and and just pick a thing and, and do it and and just like lose yourself in that little thing maybe life's like that in general like if i if i wake up in the morning i'm like right i've got to ring my insurance company i've i've got to book this flight for italy or i got this into and, and uh, oh my god I'd like get my band ready for tours like all of these stuff if you just think up if you just wake up and just think i'm gonna get a coffee and that is my task. And then it's like, you have the coffee and it's now what? Now I have the interview with Really Mental. So I'm going to go home and I'm going to set up my earpods and I'm going to sit and have this conversation. And it's like, just do one thing at a time. It's like, otherwise it, your brain just explodes. Yeah, that makes sense. Like instead of taking these big steps and overwhelming yourself, allowing yourself to take little steps every single time of the day to Definitely. stop yourself from really getting overwhelmed. I don't think anyone's perfect. No one's achieving everything that they're saying. We're just trying our best to get make every day a little bit better and try and do the best that we can to cope with the things that we've been through. Because I don't think anyone, the way we were raised, the people that are around us, I don't think people have ill intentions most of the time. I think people are just trying to do the best they can do with what they know. And they're just trying to really get through the day with what they were taught from people before them and people that are around them. Um, I wanted to ask you, if you're okay um, letting us into your brain for a second, what are some of those thoughts that are keeping you up at night and some of those things that you're like telling yourself or like being negative to yourself? And can you get yourself out of that spiral? I think a lot of my anxiety revolves around time. I'm obsessed with time and like the passing of time and like being in a certain place at a certain time and and the knowledge that like ultimately everybody you love will, will die. <laughs> And that that's really that's a really like tough one. I also struggle with like disconnection from the world around me. I I sometimes I feel like I'm a little person trapped inside my head, like behind these two eyeballs that are, like glass windows, and I can't kind of get through the windows. And like I'll find myself hanging out with my best friends, and then I'll find myself being anxious and then I'm like well if you're anxious now you're in this situation with your best friends having a great time and it's like a sunny day and you're in the park and you're feeling weird and anxious it's like if you're feeling anxious now when the fuck are you gonna not feel anxious dude and and then that kind of spirals when I'm my happiest it's like when I've just worked out and I come home and I've had my coffee and I'm just eating food and then I'm like are you literally an ape you're 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 happiest when you're you when you've got endorphins running through your brain and you're eating food that also goes down to like who we are as people like we actually are like animals at the end of the day like the basic necessities of life are what like we go back to to make us feel safe like eating exercising sleeping like those are actually yeah. the things that actually impact our brain health and the way that we feel which is actually interesting because we think that all these external things will always make us feel great, but actually the most simple things actually make us feel better because they're what we need as animals at the end of the day. Well, that's a great point. Like, what's the brain for? People think brain, people think brain is to receive information, but the brain's, the brain's main purpose is to ensure the survival of your body. It's like, genes rule everything. We are just an organism trying to replicate itself. So the brain's purpose is to make sure you eat and fuck and sleep and shit. Like everything else, <laughs> everything else is a distraction. And, and I think that's why, for example, when you take hallucinogenic drugs, if you take acid, if you take mushrooms, you take DMT, whatever it is, it disconnects the survival instinct. Mm. So it and then enables you to receive all of this other information. It's like, that's why people become so awake and they have these like epiphanies and you, they realize that 
we are the universe experiencing itself and that there is no such thing as self and that nothing means anything, but that's great that nothing means anything. And that's also why people jump off buildings when they're on acid because their brain's not trying to keep them alive. It's like, maybe that's why you're happiest when you're eating and you just worked out is because you're, you're doing what you're meant to be doing. Yeah. I think this is a really interesting conversation because we're talking about as well, what truly makes us happy at the end of the day and what is, living a fulfilled life. It does make me think when it comes to your music, Bruno, and the context of this album that we have coming up, how do you make sense of creativity after our explanation of the simplicity of us as humans? I mean, I think, okay, I, I think children are artists. If you give a kid a bunch of crayons and a bit of paper, they'll draw a picture. And I, th I think that, that our society is in its fetal stages. We view the dark ages of people being, you know, publicly ha public hangings and crusades and, and like drinking ale and all of these like dark stuff that went on and back in the day. It was like, we're still there. We're still in the dark ages. We're still at war. We still have racism. We still have borders. Like, we have not figured it out. And I feel like the education system is a product of post-industrialist capitalist um, ideals that do not facilitate us being happy as human beings. And I think that the, the education system is designed to uh, redesign us and conform us to be good droids that work in society, that get the, the little piece of paper that gives you a salary and, and basically makes you a cog to work in a giant machine. And I think that the, the art is sucked out of us. And that's why when you give an adult a pen, they will sign their name for the bill. Like, they do not draw pictures anymore. And the only way that I have managed to create is by remaining a child. And I'm still a child in my head. It makes you really vulnerable. And, but that's how, I, that's how I am a creative person. And do you think for this, like, upcoming album and stuff, what inspired you and made you want to be creative and childlike for this? This album's really interesting because I feel that uh, COVID was, I went from being uh, this, the person that I created myself to be, which was like the, the musician who tours around the world who was successful and who was being validated constantly. And then all of a sudden COVID happened and it's like, I wasn't that guy anymore. And I came back to my parents' house and I woke up every day and I ate like ham sandwiches out of my mum's fridge and I actually remember looking at myself in, like in the mirror one day I was like okay like if you're not that guy if you're not the the rock star standing on the stage and everyone's going yay it's like who the fuck are you like I couldn't even write songs in lockdown because I was just so like suffocated by the whole thing it's like well you're that's what you do that's who you are you've assigned you've assigned your identity as a songwriter You've assigned your identity as a rock star, as a successful guy, whatever. It's like, now you're not that guy. You're living in your mom's house. And so it's like, I, re I literally f returned to the child. I became the, the nine-year-old version of myself. I literally sat in my, my, old, my old bedroom and I played video games every day. At the age of 32, and my mom asked me to take out the trash and I did it. And, and it was this bizarre bizarre unnatural situation but also wonderful because it it forced me to to assess who i was and my identity aside from my own idea of myself and and figure out who i actually was when it came to writing this album i feel like i wrote it from the perspective of the child you know i wrote this really honest self-appraisal and and i and i and i thought about my experiences really free of ego because my ego had died. Yeah, that's a, a huge experience to go through at any time, let alone with a pandemic happening. How did you process all of those emotions when it comes to ego and identity? Was that just simply, it just took time? It's something that I will always be processing. Going back to what we said at the beginning of this conversation, there is a necessary element of narcissism in order to do what I do because you're talking about yourself all the time. And there's also a, 
an obligation to like to protect yourself and stuff i've written i've written a, written a song when about this called the show must go on it's the first track on my album but it's about like a musician who's on tour and and like every night you have to get up and and be the guy on the stage who's charismatic and funny and like excited to be there and like loving and like sending out love and sometimes it'll be 20 minutes before stage and i'm i'm in my hotel room eating room service watching netflix and the last thing in the whole world that i want to do is stand up on a stage in front of thousands of people like i want to be insular and like in my pillow you know so you kind of i uh, you know you and this other person who is invincible i call them the soldier and the butterfly the butterfly writes the music and the soldier performs it and um time they they can start to exist as two separate people and then it becomes confusing and i think that's why you know when you like a lot of famous musicians probably get lost in the idea of who they are they kind of just cease to exist as the original version of themselves have you ever felt like you have lost yourself along this journey i haven't um for a for, for a startup i'm not prince you know I'm, I'm not like the level of fame where like i can't escape it like when I'm on tour and I'm I'm playing in a venue, like for that moment, I am Justin Bieber. I'm in a room full of people who who are there to to listen to my music and and like you know I am that person. But the difference is for me, when I step out of the venue, no one knows who the fuck I am, and and so I can very much exist in a normal way, and I I, I do not envy people who who reach that level of fame that they can't escape it ever the reason why i think social media is so damaging because i can be jay-z whenever i want if i go on instagram you know i can just go on there and be validated whenever i want and exist in my weird little echo chamber where where everything's great and you know i'm the best version of myself and stuff um so i i, I you know I, I guess what i'm rambling here but i'm what i'm trying to say is that i don't think you, you can ever like defeat these issues this is just something you have to keep dealing with at least i know i do and I, do, I don't think i'm going to be able to do this forever because i struggle with these things you know i don't think i don't think it's like a very a very healthy thing to do being an artist or being an artist yeah in general i i don't i don't think it's sustainable for me long term i have to be honest what are you scared of i'm scared of losing my mind forever and i'm not i'm not being dramatic like i feel like this album like nearly destroyed me I feel like every album I've made has done more damage to me. Like, like there's a reason why Vincent Van Gogh cut off his ear. There is a reason why Michael Jackson made his face look the way that he did. In order to achieve exceptional things, you have to jettison balance in your life. And on an artistic level, I feel like it's being in a fishing boat. And the further you go out into the sea, the bigger the fish are that you can catch. But the, the harder it is to get back to shore. And I feel like each album I'm getting further and further out to sea and like got really, really far out and I caught some big fish. But it, times when I was like, I don't even know if I'm going to be able to get back to shore. Like, I can't even remember all the people that were on the beach. Like, they're so far away. For you, when you talk about that, right, and you talk about the toll it takes on you, could you, like, explain what that toll actually is? On, like, a really basic level, it's like, I don't know if it applies to everyone, but like I really put my heart and soul into this music and it, I feel like I'm giving a piece of myself away. It's like, you know, Harry Potter when Voldemort makes the Horcruxes. In order to achieve immortality, he splits his soul into seven pieces. And as a result, he becomes a half-life. He's this like shriveling little like ent like miniature yeah. version of himself. And like, I feel that with, with, with this, with this album particularly, I like, when I finished it, I mourned it. I, I went through a period of mourning because I, I like lost a piece of myself, and I just give it to give it to the world. It's like it's like you're you're living in like a, you're living in a dream world. You're like you're making these you're making these songs, and you're accessing this part of your brain that like that's not necessarily like stable or functional. It's like going back to the TV in like Stranger Things when they open the upside down like you open that portal and shit comes out of it and you just have to learn to deal with it. How do you deal with it? I don't really, mate. I'm all over the shop. 
There are things that I do in my life that, that help me deal with stuff. I go to the gym every day. I'm really obsessive about it because it's like that is my little moment of order and routine. And I I bury myself in my work. You know, I like I I work all the time and play play golf and I you know I hang out with just like the most wonderful crazy people in the world and but yeah I, I really I as, that's why I'm say, that's why I said to you to before I don't think this is sustainable long term because it's like it's just it's a really unbalanced place to be it's like I assign so much of my my like identity and what I do and my mental health is 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 literally defined by what I achieve musically it's like if I sit down on the piano and I write a really great song I am bouncing off the walls I am like invincible and I am like the happiest guy in the world but like if I can't write I like I have zero self-esteem I'm like oh well I'm pointless then because you know I couldn't write anything today so what's the point in me and that's what we've been saying I feel like throughout this conversation as well is embracing the uncertainty that life brings and also embracing our fears because it's all we we can do to keep moving forward and keep going to the next thing. I was wondering, what is one thing that you learn from this album that you're going to take into the last one, which could be your final? Life defining. You know, I've been very dedicated to my 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 journey and my my art and my craft, and I've always been reaching for something. And I feel like this is the first album where I've really, I've really like grabbed that thing. So in a sense, I'm just immeasurably happy and proud. And actually, for the first time, I've I've really I feel like I'm at peace because I've I've managed to to do something that I'm like really truly proud of. Do you think it's fair on yourself to create this art for other people to enjoy, but lose yourself in the process? I don't make it for other people. In some ways, I like I don't think I'm important. I don't even believe in the idea of self. I think I think self is an illusion and. I feel very strongly that I have a gift and a purpose, and my purpose is to make songs. It's like that's why I'm here. Again, going back to what I was saying before, like in in order to do something that is exceptional, I do think you have to you have to like sacrifice things. Tiger Woods is the great like the greatest golfer of our era. There's no way that guy is balanced. You know, he had a full blown meltdown because he was so focused on one thing. Like every great jazz musician from the 40s was addicted to heroin. Charlie Parker spent 16 hours a day playing a saxophone and shooting up junk. And that's why he's Charlie Parker. If you, if you want to be really well balanced and you want to be happy all the time, it's like, that's awesome. And like, I don't, I've, I'm yet to meet anyone who has done something truly exceptional and, and, and been totally at peace, you know? It's not possible. I am an I'm an artist. You know, I'm I'm an artist to my core, and I I really feel that. And like, I don't give a fuck about anything else, honestly. So you you're like you're a big you know you're a pop star. It's about how many albums you've sold, how many number ones you've had, how many Grammys you've got, how many tickets you can sell. It's like these things do not matter, and these things are not related to art. This is commerce, and I am concerned with art. And the byproduct of making good art for me is that I have had some commercial success, but this is not my primary objective. Yeah, that makes sense. Any advice you'd give people who are genuine artists that are finding that they're struggling the same way that you are? Be as kind to yourself as possible and recognize that being part of being an artist is making yourself vulnerable. And uh, good luck and I love you because you're doing something really great. That's awesome. Now, I really appreciate everything you've said. It's, I can, I can tell it's really honest and I feel as though that's in line with what you've created here with the album. So I'm really excited for the world to hear it. So that was a huge episode for us. I feel like we covered a lot of topics within that and I loved Bruno's authenticity when it came to discussing the trials and tribulations, his experience in life and his complexities as an artist, both when making this album and also generally as a human. For you, Harrison, what are some of the things you took away and found interesting from the conversation? As you know, Will, I was, I was getting into it. I really wanted to 
get inside of Bruno's brain and understand how he thinks. I found it really interesting to get an insight into a person who creates for the art, solely for the art, and gets consumed by the art, not by the fans, not by the press, not by the money, not by anything external, but solely by making the art. And I think it was really interesting to get an insight into that because he's so passionate about creating and so passionate about music that he's willing to lose himself in the process. And I found that very fascinating. I think we can definitely romanticize that sometimes when being an artist and those that are artists really just stop focusing on the external byproducts of the art because that's what we can do all the time. Like the streams, like how much your painting sells for, like the money, like the press, like the fame any of those types of things, instead of focusing on all those, because they're always the goal, right? The goal is to get, oh, I want to get a million streams. Oh, I want to get in a big movie. How about just enjoy the process of actually learning how to act, learning how to make music, the process of coming up with the song, the process of coming up with those emotions, the process, the process of painting, the process of any of those creative endeavors or anything you do, focusing on that rather than the end goal. And I think that that is something that I really took away from this chat with Bruno. What about you, Will? Yeah, definitely. I love those points you raised about embracing the stage you're at. And I think to what Bruno said, a simple thing to do to streamline everything and make life simpler and strip back is to focus on what's right in front of you. So when it comes to wherever you're at in your career, in your life, what is the thing that you have to focus on right now that is in your control to move things forward just a little bit every day. And that helps navigate some of the complexities that naturally come up in life. So thank you for tuning in and making it this far. If you enjoyed it and want to stay tuned for new episodes of amazing guests like Bruno, then follow us on our socials at Really Metal Podcast. And also, please consider sharing it with a friend that this could help. And also, potentially rate it five stars if you enjoyed it. So we're really excited for next week's episode. And again, thank you so much for tuning in to this one with Bruno. It was one of our favorites so far. So we're grateful that you're here with us. And we love you. We'll see you soon.